Hello, everybody. How's it going? Thank you all so much for coming out on this uh, early Sunday morning. Uh, this is our Science on Screen series. My name is Tim Anderson. I'm the programming coordinator here at Enzian. And uh, thank you all again. I'm really excited about this. A um, little bit about uh, the event you're at. This is, our, like I said, this is our Science on Screen series. Uh, the Science on Screen series is an initiative of the Coolidge Corner Theater in conjunction with the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Um, and the purpose of this series is uh, to expand film and scientific literacy by pairing a feature film with an expert in the field on the subject that the movie is about uh, or peripherally about. Um, the person we have brought up today is Nathan Comarsh. Um, Nathan is a performer. He's been seen in 13 countries, regularly featured uh, at the world famous Magic Castle in Hollywood, where he's playing in July, late June. Um, and has been on Penn & Teller's primetime TV series as well. He's also headlining the Orlando Improv on June 15th. Um, and so I would like to, um, Nathan will give about a 20, 25 minutes of presentation. There'll be some Q&A available after uh, he's all done. So if you've got questions, just feel free to shout those out as loud as possible and as sanely as possible. Um, and he will take care of all of that for you. But please let me welcome to the stage the incredible Nathan Comarch. Aloha, y'all. 11 a.m. on a Sunday. You guys know how to party. I do respect that. Gang, uh, we live in a world where we get the answer to almost any question by reaching my pocket and giving my phone a couple taps. And that makes it damn hard to feel something that's basic about being human. That feeling you get in your solar plexus when you're faced with a real mystery, right? When you're out on the beach and uh, the waves and your breathing and the tide synchronize, and it feels like there's no separation between you and anything else. Every art we can engage with on multiple levels, right? A painting can make me feel good, and it can give me a transporting aesthetic experience. And that transporting aesthetic experience is different in kind than a cold beer on a hot day. Magic, at its highest level, when you're up close, when you're seeing an expert, has the possibility, when the moon is in the seventh heaven and Mercury aligns with Mars, has the possibility to give us an aesthetic experience that is fundamentally different than what's possible with any other form of the arts. And that's this. It's an experience where you know that what's happening isn't real. You know that what's happening is a, a created artistic experience. But in your gut, on an instinctive level, in the marrow of your bones, it feels compellingly like there's no way for it to happen. And that's different from a puzzle that simply has an answer that you don't have the answer to. It's the idea that, that there isn't even an answer possible, right? Um, so a fundamentally different kind of aesthetic experience. How does that happen? How, how do we do that? And the answer is through hacking the cognitive process. I'm going to invite you guys, hold, uh, hold up two fingers. Cross those fingers. I want you to take, you'll notice a little V there. Place that little V up against the bridge of your nose and rub your nose up and down, right on the tip. And some of you are feeling two noses. And this is easiest when you're right at the pointy part. Are you guys feeling that? Excellent. So yeah, if you go down to the point part, you're feeling two noses. And the reason for this, obviously, we are creatures who are bombarded by photons. We've got the air shaking next to our ears. We're feeling forces that we repel against, right? But to create the experience of our lives, our minds are having to go into a creative process. It's not a passive thing. Uh, it's something where we're applying our own sort of... Uh, we won't get into the Kant right now, but uh, we're applying our, our own things to the world in order to create this model of what's around us at every single moment. And what magic does when it's working well, in order to hack that process, part of that process is making assumptions that you interpolate about what's in front of you. So if I, if I see uh, the front of someone's head and I see that they have a face, from my past experience, I interpolate around that you have, that there is a back of your head as well, ma'am, although I may not have actually seen it, right? And, our, and let me show you how that can be exploited. So what's happening is not having uh, some grasp of, 
a scientific principle that isn't accessible to the audience. So we'll talk about a very specific example of that later. The answer is not being smarter than the audience or anything like that. In fact, the more intelligent someone is, very often the more amazed they can be by good magic. And that's not just a self-serving statement, but we'll talk about why that is. Um, because if we can set a faulty assumption at the base of perception, all of the reasoning that happens from that bad perception, the better that reasoning is, the more impossible what your experience becomes. And uh, let me show you a concrete example of this with a very basic trick, sort of a schoolboy trick here. And this is something uh, many of you may see if you had like a, a beginning book in magic or something. Ooh, that's fun. Uh, this is something many of you may see if you had a beginning book in magic or something. And that is this. We'll take just a knife here, just a knife. And to prevent any sense of anything coming in through the sleeve or anything, we're going to lock that sucker down so nothing can come in or out of the sleeve away from you. As I move here, we very slowly separate. The knife becomes apparently adhered to the hand, right? Now, the way that works is this. And the reason that works is that when I'm showing you this picture, right? I'm showing you uh, a picture here of, I'm showing you a picture here of my hand around the wrist. Uh, your brain is combining that with this picture and putting the two together and making a connection. And you're not counting the fingers that are on the hands. Like that's an interesting thing about perception, right? There's this idea that our minds are aware of every detail and just kind of recording. And that turns out to absolutely not be true. Our minds are creating memories from little cues and they're creating the experience of the world around them from very specific cues that, that we're building connections between. And when there's something wrong in front of us, we're very good at identifying, oh, something's off because that may mean there's a threat. Uh, with that, let's talk about the film you guys are about to see and some of the magic that's in front of it. Uh, there is a figure that sort of creeps over this movie. And that figure is a French magician by the name of Jean-Eugène Robert Houdin or Robert Houdin, if you're a Florida boy like myself, H-O-U-D-I-N. And Houdin has a reputation as sort of the father of modern magic for many, many reasons. But what happens in this film that's interesting, it is a completely fictional story, completely fictional characters. But what they've done is they've taken inspiration from magic at the time. And among those magicians, specifically Houdin, and using CGI, they've sort of reconstructed what that experience might have been like. So I want to give you guys some background on a couple pieces of Houdin's magic that you guys are going to see on screen. Uh, the first is there's a piece you'll see very early in the film where a woman's handkerchief vanishes. She's out in the audience. There is uh, a potted plant on the stage. And the performer sows some seeds and pours some water. And slowly, the audience watches an orange tree bloom. And then from behind the orange tree, her handkerchief is being carried by two butterflies floating in midair. That is based on something Houdin actually did. Houdin started life as a watchmaker, and he would create automata. So these were mechanical figures that were driven by springs and camshafts and all these other things that would do these amazing activities. And so the magic part of that in Houdin's performance is the, the handkerchief would vanish, it would reappear inside the orange, but the creation of life, uh, they, would, they would see and be aware that what they were looking at was an automata, was a mechanical toy, but they were fascinated by, by the quality of it. You'll also see there's a scene here uh, with some political implications uh, that has a sword on a dance floor. That'll make sense a little bit later. Uh, this is based on something where Houdin took advantage of the fact that they were at a moment in time uh, this was in the, the mid-19th century, when scientific understanding what was known to sort of in the uppermost public uh, published areas and what was known to the general public were two very, very different things. And so Houdin had a, a small chest on stage, and he'd invite the biggest man in the audience to come up, and the biggest man in the audience would, would heave and groan and pull, and he could not lift that chest up off the stage. And then he'd invite a five-year-old girl up, and she'd pick it up like it was nothing. Because his stage was a giant electromagnet. <laughs> and apparently, now, now the accounts I've heard of this have all been based from the French sources. So they've got a very strong colonial bent. But allegedly, the story is 
that that was part of the effort to suppress a small rebellion in Algeria that was run by the Marabou, who were a tribe who had, uh, and again, this is a very French perspective on the thing, uh, who had magicians that were sort of the source of their authority was that they were able to do amazing things. And so Louis Napoleon of, of France brought, commanded Houdin to show them the French magic. And part of that was that he showed that he could sap the power of the strongest marabou warrior uh, using his electromagnet on stage. He also had some little shockers in the handle to give the guy a, a little jolt there as well. So, uh, so that is Houdin, uh, and that is Houdin's magic that you'll see within there. You'll also see some, some references to a decidedly American religion. And to the best of my knowledge, this is the only religion uh, that has come out of, and again, the best of my knowledge is an important caveat there, uh, the, only, uh, the only religion to really come from America, which is spiritualism, which started in the 1840s, uh, got huge traction uh, following the Civil War because you had huge numbers of young people who were dying early, which means huge numbers of bereaved people who, who really wanted contact with their husband, with their brother, with their son. And where there was a market, there was a demand. And there were people who were willing, there were some people who were in very much honestly, authentically believing this, but there were people who were willing to use magic tricks essentially to prey on that grief and sell them, I can give you a message from the other side. And they would use techniques to have a letter sealed and examined, and then the writing appeared there was a letter from the loved one or uh, uh, everybody would, they'd be tied up. And so magicians had a complicated relationship with this. Uh, at, at our best moments, uh, magicians used this as an opportunity to do something that was timely and to, and to prove that this spiritualism, that the spiritualists were in front were frauds. Uh, so they would do exposés of what was going on. You did have some magicians who were cashing in. And you'll see a segment here where Eisenheim, the magical character, sort of cashes in on the spiritual movement. And, uh, and that, was, that was accurate. There was a, uh, we'll say that story possibly for the Q&A, we'll see. But there are some stories of, of magicians uh, taking on, using their powers for fraudulent purposes in stage shows uh, to kind of do that thing as well. So we'll see that too. Um, we also have represented on screen, I'd say inspired, because what's happened in this film is they've taken artistic inspiration by things that are actually performed, and they've used CGI, they've used their imagination to kind of create what it may have felt like to experience these things. And one of the illusions that plays a very prominent role in the plot is inspired by something that you can see live and in person down the road at Disney, and that is uh, Pepper's Ghost. Uh, and uh, so I was, my, my parents had a cabin when I was growing up in the summer in the Appalachian Mountains. And uh, I remember there was these big plate glass French doors, right? And at night they'd be grilling outside those doors and you'd have, we'd have bright lights on inside and there'd be the fire on right outside, right? Outside the glass. And through the glass as a kid, I used to, I used to, make it look like, oh, I'm on fire because I could see the image of the fire and I could see the image of myself transposed. Pepper's Ghost goes back to 1569 in the publication of the description of the principle. Uh, it got a uh, huge popularity in the 19th century and the, um, when most of what you're going to see in the film uh, is all based on things from the 19th century and it's uh, artistic imaginings based on actual accurate things that happen there, right? Um, but the principle of Pepper's ghost in simple is that if I have a surface like a piece of glass that can both reflect light and light can actually transmit and pass through it, depending on how I light the thing in front and behind, I can superimpose things on the scene. So in the Pepper's ghost illusion, people would come into a theater and they would see these compelling images of spirits right in front of them and it freaked people out. And that's kind of a little bit accurate to what you'll see in the film there. And I'll mention, uh, to this day, there was a couple years back, there was a whole thing of these holograms of performers at concerts, right, of Tupac Shakur, and, and these holograms, which were sort of billed as this very new technology, the core technology was Pepper's Ghost. The core technology in those goes back to 1569, so kind of a fun, everything old is new again. Um, with that, uh, any questions on, on what we've covered? Cool.
we'll give you guys, there'll be some time, because uh, we'll, I want to leave you with this. I want to leave you with this. The, uh, the Brazilian Paulo Coelho said every day, if we're looking for it, there's what he called the, the magic moment. Momento magico. Well, he would have said it in Portuguese, and that's bad Spanish, but close enough, close enough. I'm going to invite you, we're going to do something very naughty here together. I'm going to invite you to take out your phone, uh, and I'm going to invite you to open up the calculator for us. Uh, and this calculator could be on your phone, it could be on your watch, perhaps you keep an abacus in your purse like I do. And uh, no pressure. Uh, if you don't have one, we'll get you involved in a different way. But the goal here is for all of us to be involved in creating something extraordinary together. And before we go further, uh, we have a woman, a beautiful Paisley uh, kind of top. Uh, what, is, what is your name, ma'am? Marianne, it's a pleasure. Marianne, would you give us all a two-digit number, Marianne? 2121. So if you've got your calculator open, I'll go ahead and hit in 2121. Hit the X key, friends, the multiplication, the times. And before we go further, what is your name, my friend? Ryan. Ryan, would you give us a different two-digit number, sir? Uh, 16. 16, I love it. So everybody put in 16, one, six. So 21 times 16 times one, six. Hit that X key again, friends. Uh, if you're on an iPhone, it'll say 336. If you're on Android, you'll get a couple different numbers. Maybe a little fuzzy. That's OK. Uh, what is your name, ma'am? Tanya. Tanya, would you give us a final two-digit number? 30. 3 zero, gang. So 336 times 30, 3 zero equals, is this right, gang? 1 zero, zero 080. Zero. A lot of magic shows have like lasers, tigers, gorgeous dancers. That's not what you guys want. What you guys want is math. And I'm giving it to you, baby. Uh, hit, the, uh, hit the plus key, gang. Hit the plus key. And if you would uh, hold a finger out for me. Move it in a gentle circle and just jab a key at random. Jab one of those keys at random. Excellent. Uh, would you do the same next to Marianne? Just jab a key. Yeah, you got it from the bottom, from the bottom, blindly at random. Excellent. Uh, Ma'am? Perfect. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Would you as well? Excellent. Tanya? Awesome, gang. We'll grab a perfect, guys. Uh, so if you're following along, I'd like you to hit the plus key and then, oh, one more, one more. Excellent. Yeah, just to make it feel good. Hit the plus key and then hit plus 641038. That number again, 641038. So hit the plus key and then hit 641038. Math at the Magic Show, gang. Uh, if you've got it, if you've got it, uh, looks like Ryan might. Is that accurate? Ryan, call it out. Call out what you've got, my friend. Oh, let's do this. To make it easier, Ryan. Uh, make it easier, liberal arts major. Uh, call out just like seven, five, three. Every day, a magic moment if we pay attention. What month is it, gang? The sixth month? Is today the fifth? Does anyone know the precise time at this minute? Our magic moment is right now. And it always is, right? Because that's all we have is right now. Any questions now? My name is Nathan Comarsh. Enjoy the show.